this week on To the Contrary. First, the toxic link between mass shootings and misogyny. Then, a huge win against a top school in a Title IX settlement. Behind the headlines, teaching young women financial literacy. Bay, welcome to To the Contrary, a discussion of news and social trends from diverse perspectives. Up first, mass shootings. Several factors are being blamed for America's mass shooting crisis, but one perhaps underreported link between almost all shooters is misogyny. The shooter in Dayton, Ohio, kept so called rape lists of women he wanted to target. The 19 year old who killed four people in Gilroy, California, read books containing misogynistic screeds. And experts say hatred of women is a core part of white supremacy, the ideology that inspired a man to kill 22 people in El Paso, Texas. According to Mother Jones magazine, there have been 63 mass shootings, killing four or more people since 2011. Almost one-third of those killers had a history of stalking and harassing women half specifically targeted women, and almost 9 in 10 had a history of domestic abuse. In addition, of the 115 spree killers since 1982, only four are women. Many of these individuals who go on to do uh, these hate-filled um, types of uh, hunting sprees, uh, where they find areas of the country uh, to, to make their stance by killing people, also tend to have a violent history against women. And, you know, it, it, we are just really beginning to drill down on uh, sort of who these individuals are and what uh, they have in common. And part of the challenge has been that we have been blocked for so long in Congress with being able to actually do a study of gun violence. So, Megan Beyer, is this component of uh, the psychological makeup of a mass killer being ignored? <laughs> Well, it looks like it. Nine out of ten of these mass shooters have a history of domestic violence. It's the elephant in the middle of the living room. And yet Republicans will not allow us the funding to do the study to connect the dots. I mean, I think there, it's, there is a, a, a relationship. Do we make a causal link? I think we have to understand a little bit better. Uh, these are people who are deeply disturbed, and we can't get away from that. In this case, and in most, we are ignoring violence against women and domestic violence. A woman is killed every day by a partner or an abuser, and it's something that we just don't talk about. You spend more time fighting domestic violence. You're not only going to help maybe stop future mass killings, but you're going to help society in general. But, you know, one of the, the red flag law that maybe Congress is going to consider, and maybe it's not, and maybe the president is for, and maybe he's not, um, th that's... You're, they're going to call up a whole lot of people with horrible backgrounds. I mean, can you really keep track of using the fact that domestic violence should be taken into account? Could you keep track of all the maniacs out there who shouldn't have guns? Well, I think well, there are a lot of family members who know if there's someone in their home that has access to a lot of guns and they're saying things that are violent and, and scary and they've got mental issues, Believe me, it is so hard for people. You know, I happen to have in our family, there's somebody with, not violent at all, but with mental health issues, and it's very Which hard. Which family doesn't. Right. And, uh, you know, you want to protect someone. Imagine what that feels like. Some of these mass shootings that we've heard about where there's so many guns in the home and these poor mothers, one of whom was killed, you, you'd you like to think that the law would recognize this. In Maryland, the law went into effect at the beginning of the year. Uh, about 750 cases were reported. Judges only allowed the removal of the guns in 400 cases. But imagine in those 400 cases, maybe we were able to prevent one of these terrible See, I, shootings. I think it's like the broken window uh, theory in, in New York City where you get people on the smaller things, you keep them from doing the bigger things. I think we should track people who commit violence against animals 
as well as against women, as well as against men. But uh, the animals and the women get ignored often. I well, the challenge, though, is that you have, at least with one of these mass shooters this, this past weekend, his mother said that he, she had taken information about him, her concern, to, to the police, and they didn't follow through. So I think we also have to take a step back from the bigger picture and say, is law enforcement actually following through on these tips? Because if, we get, if suddenly we open the door to lots of tips, are they able to actually keep up with them? I, but I, you know, I think an, an interesting point here and a, a worry that I think conservatives have with these laws is that they're going to be, it may cut, catch people who um, may have some different difficulties, people coming, a former um, military servicemen, for example, who may go through spells where they would feel like, well, suddenly I may n no longer be able to have the guns in my possession, even if I have a, you know, PTSD that, you know, something may trigger me. So we, we have to understand exactly what the unintended consequences could be to broad sweeping leg legislation. We and you've been, you're, mm -hmm. you run one of the largest NGOs fighting domestic violence in the country. What? How difficult is it to get the word out and to get people mm -hmm. to pay attention? You know, this issue is is very hard. It's very local uh, to states, specifically about uh, gun possession and data. The data is there. There's a lot of you know new policies and making sure the data is used and used correctly. And with domestic violence cases, you have a unique opportunity because of protective order databases and a lot of things that we fought for for survivors to sort of get on the book, so that this can be happening. But we can't ignore you know very few instances where we can say this person has a history or is likely to domestic violence is one of those things where we have the information. We know that this is happening in homes. One in five women are a victim of sexual assault and domestic violence. And so we have a tool. We need to use it. Well, I was telling a story about a, a family member who remained nameless um, who finally left her husband, not because of all the violence against her, and there was a lot, a lot of broken bones, uh, but she left because she found herself sitting in the bedroom with his loaded gun while he was sleeping. She was afraid she was going to shoot him. So we have to really look at, too, the way women are, are treated when, in fact, they have to defend themselves against these violent perpetrators. Yeah, there's a, there's a big epidemic in this country about why women stay with abusers, why mothers don't make changes, kick their sons out. You know, there's so many stories about, you know, the, 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 the abused or the survivors really in control. And that's one of our main problems in this country is that we still are in this position of victim blaming. What do you mean the, the, the survivors in control? Well, if you, you know, you know you're being abused, you have choices, you can leave a situation, you can, you can, you can move, you can so report the public, it. So the public blames so the, pu the, yeah, so the survivor, so the, so the, the victim. The, the discourse yeah. is that, you know, we have people who perpetrate uh, domestic violence and they're being enabled by their, I mean, people are even accused of enabling their abusers. And so societally, yeah. that's one of the biggest things that we see is this sort of, you know, just pull yourself up and, you know, move right along is probably one of the biggest challenges that's, we have. In that's terms one of the most shocking this. things that people out there have to realize. Domestic violence is perpetrated because society in general looks at the person who's having the violence perpetrated upon them as a, as you said, enabling or, well, she had choices, they could leave. It's unbelievable that they still blame the person who's the victim. Well, remember well, Anita Hill, why didn't she quit? Why'd she stay? You know, all, the questions are always around the woman. Uh, and um, how, is this a tipping point of sorts? Do you think, I mean, with the three mass shootings Could be. within a couple of weeks of, of each other? Well, we thought, or, no? we yeah. thought Newtown was a tipping point. Remember, when, right, and, you know, and Parkland, kids were killed. the president yeah. said, just like he's that? saying now, that he might do background checks. Why is but then that? he met with LaPierre, and that was all over. He met with LaPierre again this week, so well, who knows? Right, exactly, the president. But one thing, with the NRA being in the condition that it's in, does it still have the power that it used to? I mean, even as a lobbying arm, it may still have influence, but, you, but it, there, it goes beyond just NRA members. There are millions of Americans who are fearful of the slippery slippery slope of saying, okay, we're just going to take assault ban assault weapons off the table. We're going to take this. And it, it's similar to the tobacco so fight. It started very small and ended to the what, point where... Why isn't about? the gun control lobby saying to them, your right to own a weapon is not, does not supersede my right to live, my child's right 
to live because that is what it has come down to in this country. Because they will tell you it isn't NRA members or law-abiding gun citizens that are doing this. And why are it's people crazy people? Well, I do think there's a shift. I think that there is a large, you know, the the tragedy of m many of these shootings in the past five to ten years have turned um, victims into activists and their families and parents and others who are getting together. And it, there's a there's a groundswell. I don't think we've seen the the height of it. But, but clearly, what the gun control lobby is doing has not worked, right? Why not change and be more direct? Your guns are killing me I think it's a different lobby. I think it's I think it's a bipart. It's not your traditional, you know, you know, limitation on guns. I think it's real people with real stories yeah, who I think so too. Mm -hmm. And at some point the democracy has to trump the dollars yes. that have gone into all of these members of Congress who but I'm sorry, but I don't think if you took a poll of Americans that their fear would be that some guns, especially semi-automatics, would be taken away. I think their fear is that they're going to be in Walmart and someone is going to shoot them with a semi-automatic. I think that's a greater fear. But I think we have a real opportunity. You know the phrase Nixon going to China. It took Nixon to go to China because he was anti-communist. I think uh, President Trump does have the opportunity to be that, have that moment uh, with the gun lobby because they trust him, I think, and that he may be able to work out a solution that's going to get everybody on board and not have the kind of, uh, get shall we everybody say, on board? I, I, getting the gun it's lobby. It's not going to be so supportive. watered down that, I mean, you could, I could all, at the beginning of the week, you could hear the Mitch McConnell mm -hmm. saying, I think well, whatever we come up with, the Democrats are going to shoot it down. I think, well, but the, bad, the choice, Democrats, bad choice of words. <laughs> Well, whatever, <laughs> you know, pun not intended. But um, w the Democrats are going to object to it because it's it won't it won't do anything, but it allows the Republicans to walk away and say we did something. I think you have when in fact it's so watered yeah. down, it's totally ineffectual. I think you have a better chance with Trump to get it done than you would if a Democrat was president right now. So uh, let's hope he takes that opportunity. You know, within reason, there are some measures I think even the gun community would support. I, I would just say, though, that uh, part of something that we are ignoring is that um, while mass shootings happen, and they shouldn't, there are a lot of people who die at the hands of guns that are that are that were held and owned by people who never registered, will never go through a background check to get that right. gun. And when we talk about the inner city communities and the black communities in crime, what about the people who died there who will never get any attention on them? And so I think there's a, that part of that hypocrisy that a lot of conservatives will say, well, wait a minute, you want to talk about con gun control to stop mass shootings? That's one thing. But you're ignoring a whole lot of people for whom gun control will never stop. Chicago. I'm confused here. You're saying that conservatives who are anti-gun control are mainly concerned about poor black inner city neighborhoods and not mainly concerned about the NRA that doles out tens of millions of dollars into their pockets I'm, to get reelected and who has had a chokehold on this issue for 30, 40 years now. I'm, I'm just pointing out that there's some hypocrisy where uh, for the people who die every day because of gun violence at the hands of people who got guns not by going to a gun show, not by, by going to Walmart and buying it, but by buying it illegally legally, they will never be stopped from what happens. And, and that's, a, that's a larger group than I think the mass shootings that occur every year. But that assumes that broader, sensible policies and controls won't affect the flow of guns into this country. We have a market for it. And that's an ass the assumption that gun control or sensible gun policy is not going to have a trickle-down effect for people getting illegal guns, I think is a little cynical. I think that there are absolutely things that we can do to keep illegal guns off the street and out of the hands of people who, um, you know, are not getting getting them uh, registered, at, absolutely. And in fact, that's what we did in Virginia. We had a one gun a month law because we found that guns were being sent up to New York mm -hmm. where it was difficult to get a gun. So mm -hmm. illegally people were obtaining guns and they were sending down drugs to our urban areas. Mm -hmm. So we limited the flow, limited the market of drugs that could be obtained illegally. Guns. I mean, guns that could be <laughs> illegal. Too bad we didn't get the drugs, but we did get guys, the guns. The bad guys, <laughs> the guns, there'll always be a market for it, just like they get the drugs now. Well, we, we shall see if this, if this situation prompts any change. Let us know what you think. Please follow me on Twitter at Bonnie Urbay and at To The Contrary. From shootings to campus sexual assault. Dartmouth College has agreed to pay $14 million to settle a lawsuit brought by nine women claiming they were raped, sexually assaulted, and harassed by former professors. The suit sought $70 million for violating Title IX, and the plaintiffs called Dartmouth a 21st century animal house. 
the settlement which must be court approved is one of the largest in higher education history the women are former students who were involved in a research study by the department of psychological and brain sciences looking at sexual desire and attractiveness they claim the professors preyed upon them allegedly hosting drinking and hot tub parties three professors who have since resigned or retired were not part of the suit but may face criminal charges female scientists say the case was an example of the barriers women face in science dartmouth has also agreed to address the obstacles that prevent female students from succeeding in the sciences and female professors from gaining tenure Trees, this to me sounds like something that you know would have gone on unfettered in the 70s or 80s but would be so far beyond the bounds of what any professor no matter how criminally insane they might be to do it today and yet it's going on today uh why uh it's interesting um because i think there's still a lot there's still allegations to be had here the new hampshire um, attorney general looked into it and i think as of now he may have found that there was nothing conclusive to suggest that actually anyone was raped um, I will say that uh, it's the, the, the sto news stories paint this as like you know sexual harassment run amok, sexual assault run amok by professors. Um, but let's not forget these were grown women, not 18-year-old girls. These were 20, 30, 20 high 20-year-old women who were in situations, and none of them have ever alleged that money was being withheld, uh, uh, positions were being withheld, or or uh, exchange in exchange for you know sexual um, uh, 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 you know behaviors, and so. I, I, I worry that you're painting an entire body by just some allegations from a few women. I, I do question whether it's really as bad as it's as it's made out to be. I, I just wonder, um, it, when you're talking about this kind of situation, it's about an imbalance of power. And clearly, the professor has power over the students. And so, to me, it was a a breach of the responsibility he had as a professor. I don't think any professor should be dating any student oh, who he is teaching. That. And and that's the problem here, that it was really more of his, uh, you know, being irresponsible about his position. I think it was important also positions. to note where this happened. We know that there's a dearth of women who make it through um, these really rigorous programs and end up, you know, you know, getting tenure or PhD programs. And the laboratory is is notorious for isolation. Your professor or your, you know, your advisor is in control of your schedule. We know it's why a lot of women don't make it because there's no balance. People can't, you know, have any kind of life. You're really beholden to that one person, and there's no accountability. On the in the best case scenario, you have to work like a dog and hope that you know you get through your program. And the in the in, in the best case scenario and the worst case scenario you know you're in this case assaulted or intimidated but it's just ripe for that there's so many imbalances of power in the system when we know most of the folks in in these prof in these professions and these professorships are, are men um, with a lot of power with a very little accountability and very little that can be done a lot of these folks have jobs for life for their whole life I mean you know I what's just, really at stake I just have no tolerance for if these guys are found to be guilty and I think Patrice raises a good point to find that out, but I'll tell you. What do you mean if? I mean, they, they, $14 million it needs, dollars worth. $14 million. Oh, that's a settlement. They have been. That's, the, it, that's a settlement. It's a settlement that are, needs to be court approved, but are, I mean, the point is, the money's guilty, on the table. It are, wouldn't be there. If they are truly guilty, maybe this is a little extreme, but I've, I've had it with these rapists getting off light. I say castration and saltpeter. <laughs> <laughs> swear to God. I, I, I do worry, though. Um, does it have a chilling effect? on the relationships between professors and grad students, female grad students. I mean, apparently, you know, the socialization outside of the classroom setting is really important. You get to network with these professors and, and in the hot they tub? know. Now, yeah. in the hot tub, I would agree. The hot tub is not the place for socialization, but going on, on trips to conferences where you're discussing sure. research. Sure. You know, all of a right, sudden, But it's not the woman's fault if, it, it's if not, but, she, you know, but, she's having to dodge passes. And, you know, but we've seen how um, in lots of workplace settings, suddenly a lot of men in leadership positions are saying, I'm not going to sit down. I'm not going to take a young woman to dinner who's a colleague because I'm worried that it could have a negative impact and if, if, a, a false allegation. Stuff, right? I think yeah. okay, people, but, I think, wait, I happen to know of a Democratic governor of a fairly large state who will not have meetings anymore with a woman unless somebody else is in the room. Mm -hmm. 
And I don't think that's so chilling. I don't think that's so horrible. Um, isn't it better than have having women being pressured to have sex with professors in hot tubs? I, I mean, for both you persons. say this is something that worries you. Why would it worry you? Well, it worries me. I mean, does it worry? It, I know it doesn't worry you because it prevents these situations from occurring. Well, I mean, if, if the importance of seeing more women getting into academia and into the lab and into these careers, um, and, and suddenly you're not, you're not able to progress in your careers and there are fewer women in the pipeline because suddenly the male colleagues are not bringing them to meetings, bringing them to conferences because of that, that does worry me. I mean, it, it's, if you make a rule to decide whether you have women in your office or not, whether you take meetings or not, whether you have lunches or not, uh, it, it does in the, alt in the long run, impact women's advancement sure, in well, these different industries. Well, I think that, you know, there, we can't ignore the realities. I mean, there, there are lots of other situations, you know, doctors, gynecologists, yeah. others, where there has to be another person in the room. It's sensible because it's, a, it's about security, it's about safety, and it's about accountability. It's about litigation. It, well, <laughs> And it's about litigation. Well, that, that's, true that's true too. It's about protecting women. That's true too. It's about protecting women. And in this, in this society, parties. we just talked. Yeah. You know, we talked about misogyny, and it's how it plays out. The balance, the imbalance of power in these relationships with these grad students, is is just you know hard to overstate, really. Mm -hmm. um, and so you know, in any any situation, whether you're a professor or even a teacher in high school, this the, you can't ignore the fact that no matter how old the person is, it could be your boss, you could be the same age. There is a power in balance, and I think that these are very smart people who can figure out how to be good mentors without jeopardizing the privacy and security of the people that they're mentoring. Well, somebody's cell phone is going on. Turn it off. We'll keep going. But it remind, when you say something like, well, women are going to miss out on this because they're trying to prevent sexual assault, sexual abuse by professors, etc., it reminds me of the last story we talked about. You know, women who are in abusive situations are, are at fault because they stay. And I wouldn't call it blaming the victim because I hate the term victim, okay? Mm -hmm. Blaming the survivor, mm -hmm. uh, the heroine who stayed in yeah. and, because she couldn't get out. Um, so why would you, again, let's get back to the penalty here. Is the, is the loss of the one-on-one -on -one meetings so harmful to women's careers or education that it's worth it's not worth getting rid of sexual assault you know, I, it, maybe I didn't explain. I would, I do not want to see the hot tub meetings continue, Bonnie. I do not. And, and no, if I didn't even did mean it, that. I just meant that it isn't the, if there is a problem there, isn't the penalty, the loss, so minor mm. compared with what's going on now mm -hmm. that it shouldn't even be raised as an issue, as if a I, factor. Well, if I can jump into your defense, sure, Patricia, and that is that I understand exactly what you're saying. There's going to be a chilling effect. It won't be something specific you can point to probably going to take almost a generation for people to really get work their way through this. In the meantime, men are afraid. They're afraid. They see There's all these huge people. There's already a chilling effect. There are right. so few Absolutely. women getting through these programs and that's for why. a that's part of it. host of reasons. This is just one yeah. of them. And yeah. this one change or this one, you know, you know, slap on the wrist or whatever it is that these folks are going to get is not going to make a it's not going to make a huge well, it's, difference. Well, it's going to take, it's take a while. I, I actually think it could be more immediate because when I think of chilling effect, I think of I've got three grad students. I can only take two on, on two on the two. One is a woman, two are men. Uh-oh, if I take this, who knows what could happen. I'm more likely to take that young man or those two young men. Or the Th people those are who are going to choose those... the men anyway because the bias that exists. Right. But I, I, yeah, I, exactly. Yeah. They've been doing it for yeah, you know, now decades. Now they have a reason to ignore yeah. the women. Let me, tough question to you, I know, okay. but this was exactly what I was thinking when he was elected. The, the climate that the guy at the top of the country in the White House has created, which is clearly anti-female, bragging about grabbing genitalia, grabbing about, you know, all these female conquests, paying off hookers for having had sex with them. She's not uh, my type. <laughs> sure, certainly, uh, yeah, he's never had presidents I mean, like that before. But I, now, I do wait a minute. Say, I uh, was, uh, 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 we have uh, never, uh, we have uh, never had a president like this LBJ before. LBJ used to have sex in the room next to his wife it does in the White House. It does, it, anyway. Those kinds of things <laughs> were nothing compared to uh, yeah. what... No, no, I'm sorry. I've, I'm a student of American history. It, there is nothing like this Anita, president Anita before. LBJ and more on Meet with Juanita Broderick on Clinton. You'll hear a little more. But let's go back to your main point, and that is... Um, 
as I said before, I think just like with the gun lobby, I think this president has a real opportunity to advance the agenda for women. He has more female advisors than any previous president. He's gaining more as time goes on. He actually does respect women's opinion. I think he needs to do more and can do more reaching into the misogynist groups out there to say, hey, women are true. Give of them time. a chance. We're out of time. Got to go. That's it for this edition. Sorry. Sorry we didn't get to financial literacy. We'll have that on an upcoming show. Please follow me on Twitter and visit our website, pbs.org slash to the contrary. And whether you agree or think to the contrary, see you next week. Funding for To the Contrary provided by the Cornell Douglas Foundation, committed to encouraging stewardship of the environment, land conservation, watershed protection, and eliminating harmful chemicals. Additional funding provided by the Wallace Genetic Foundation, the Colcom Foundation, and the Charles A. Freoff Foundation. For a transcript or to see an online version of this episode of To the Contrary, please visit our PBS website at pbs.org forward slash to the contrary. Be more PBS.